Ed, uh, you and Lowell, let's let's go back uh, to the production cars and uh, talk about the birth of the Stingray and how I, I remember vividly on television when the Corvette Stingray was introduced and what a huge, huge event that was, a uh, game changer. So tell us a little bit about how that came about. Well, let's start really with the Stingray Racer, which is really the heart of it all. And it was the late 1950s. Harley Earl had been running GM Design since 1928. And in his last years, he was doing, his cars were getting bigger and bigger, heavier and heavier, throwing more and more chrome on them. And he had a vision for the second generation Corvette which was similar to the 58 Corvette, but with a uh, bow tail fastback roofline on it, and it had a lot of chrome. Bill Mitchell, who was part of the new wave of designers at GM, wanted to do something a lot leaner, a lot more fluid than what Harvey Earl was doing, and he began work on the Stingray Racer. Lowell talked about the Stingray Racer being done as a race car, but the inspiration for that design came from streamliners in Italy, very lean streamliners with, with uh, fender blisters over the tires, and that's really where the theme for the Stingray came from. Peter Brock developed some great sketches based on that inspiration, uh, and Larry Shinoda was the person who really translated what was done in sketches into great forms for the Stingray Racer, which led to the 63 Stingray, and every Corvette since then has been inspired by the original Stingray. Those shapes, those forms, even the most latest Corvettes. Yeah, so I remember um, when I was a wee boy. My father came home one day. He was a doctor in Western Massachusetts, and he gave up. I guess sort of midlife crisis gave up his Buick convertible for a, a '66 Marina Blue convertible. And the minute in those days, I think Harry touched on this. When you had a Corvette in your neighborhood, you had a Stingray. You really stood out. I mean, it was my neighbor who had an RS. His, his father had an RS Camaro. Suddenly, it was toast. So um, I think it's it's. Almost, it's easy to underestimate the impact of that car when it came out, how dramatic it was. Ed's right. I know we had a big debate with Fred about whether the Disco Volante was the inspiration for that. Um, I know that's, I think, Fred's view. But you can certainly see those shapes um, in, in the early Stingray. But what I love is the evolution from year to year, which of course keeps NCRS and Bloomington alive, is all these little changes that were made. And then uh, the evolution and what um, I just wrote about in another article was the famous six tail lamp uh, stingray. So I think back in 65 there was a, what we used to what we call a GM, a mid-cycle enhancement. So there was going to be a visual refresh in the car and one of the themes was that it had six tail lamps in the back. So some of you may know that there were a limited number of six tail lamp cars done um, for Wingate Chevrolet out in, in, uh, in California. But what I've always found interesting is all the show cars that GM did always had six tail lamps, but none of the production cars did. So it's a minor detail, but something that's always fascinating. Yeah, they they built one uh, built well. They built one for Harley Earl, who had already retired, but they built a very special Stingray for him. It had the six tail lamps, and then it had that exhaust that flowed out of the front fenders. And whenever Mitchell built something special, he was built something special for himself. He had quite a collection of very special and unusual cars. So, so just quickly, going back to that era, you know, um, Ed certainly has lived through this experience as well, um, but, you know, the executives would conjure up these cars for themselves. So what, what, in the lead up to the Stingray, not only was there the Stingray race car, but there was the Maple Shark. And so it was gradually dropping Yankees along the way, and of course the Maple Shark, to your point, was sort of Bill Mitchell's personal car that happened to be a GM show car, but it, it really conveyed this shark theme, this very aggressive design, and so when the final car came out, you know, you, you could tell where that was coming from of all that lead up, but even so, it was still a very dramatic car. Yeah, thank you. 
Now we want to get Tony DeLorenzo involved here. Uh, in the uh, in the 60s and 70s, you know, the Corvette racing was really handled by independents. And I remember being at Daytona in 1970 and seeing you and uh, uh, your cars being pushed to the grid and, and admiring the beautiful preparation of your team uh, as, a, as an independent and not really knowing that much about you. How did Owens Corning Racing, you know, come about? And, uh, you know, tell us, uh, you know, some of the history of how you accomplished what you did. Well, we, uh, I got interested in racing. My, my uncle took me to Meadowdale Raceway and uh, his company, which was a brewery, Peter Hand Brewery, had a race team. And uh, Harry Hoyer Jr. was the driver and they had those, those were the scarabs. Right? The scarab. Yeah. And I'm just giving this as a preamble. I walked up with my uncle to, we got about from here to that camera, away from the car, and the crew chief started the engine. And it was obviously a small block, probably about 390 inches, four two-throat Weber carburetors, and the exhaust sound just literally blew me away. I, and I said, right at that minute, I said to myself, Somehow, some way, I'm going to drive a race car. And I like to tell my friends, it was downhill from there. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, uh, my brother and I started plotting to uh, how am I going to get a car? Because we've got to go. I started reading up on SECA, Sports Car Club of America, and uh, you had to be 21 years old. What a revolting development that was. <laughs> anyway, so as I was getting towards graduating from college, uh, we started working on my father about that. Will you get a corporate? Yeah. Well, God bless Dad. He made two mistakes. First, he agreed to get it. Second, he agreed to let us order it. <laughs> so we ordered heavy duty everything. 64 fuel injected Corvette, heavy duty four speed, um, heavy duty transmission, heavy duty brakes, and uh, the order went in. And I had a summer job at that point at Chevrolet. I think it was sales promotion. Judy asked me what I did, and I can't remember. <laughs> well, anyway, the phone rang. Hello? Tony, this is Zora Duntoff. <laughs> God called. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He said, um, your father has ordered a heavy-duty Corvette. Who is going to drive it? And I was, still, I was still frozen in fear. I said, he is? <laughs> I told Judy, I said, I wish I could have been a fly in this wall and look at his expression as he rolled his eyes. So he said, again, who's going to drive it? I said, I am. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to take it to driver school at Watkins Glen. That's all I need to know. So when the car came to the house, it had a freshly scrubbed in set of Goodyear Blue Street race tires, which I'm sure Zora scrubbed in himself. And uh, we were off not long after that to, to Watkins Glen, but we prepared it for racing. So how do you do that? Put a roll bar in it. You got to chop five holes in the floor pan, so you rip the carpeting out. And then the spare tire carrier, and we, we modified the exhaust so we could put straight pipes out the back and take the mufflers off very quickly. And uh, bumpers and bumper brackets and all that stuff. So off we went to Watkins Glen, and I, I passed uh, the driver's school with flying colors, and we went back home, and <laughs> my dad had sold the car to one of his guys that work for him in the Chicago office. And so he said, the car's got to go back to Chevrolet 440 uh, tomorrow. And my brother and I looked at each other and went, oh my God. So we didn't have time to do anything. We threw everything in the car. Bumpers, carpeting, spare tire carrier, on and on and on. Still had the open exhaust. I don't know. Trouble with that explanation. But anyway. The car went back and my dad called me up and said, um, when that car comes back to the house, don't touch it. Yes, sir. Anyway, so it took him two weeks to remanufacture it. 
and came back and it looked like it just came out of St. Louis, it was perfect. And sadly, it, it went to Chicago, where my dad's friend was, an employee. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, it was stowed and stripped and burned. And I wish I, wish I still had it. I wish I did. Anyway, so that's how it all got started for me. And then we, we, uh, I got a, I raced, my dad said, I'm going to give you a Corvair. You could do a Corvair. He said, you can do whatever you want with it. But if you make it so that you can't drive it on the street, you're going to have to walk or take the bus. Yes, sir. And I immediately turned it into an A sedan for a race car. And I raced that car. I towed that car. I drove that car all over the place. And I, uh, Central Division, SECA, and I, after I graduated, I moved to Boston to do some graduate work in public relations. Gee, what a coincidence. <laughs> anyway, uh, and the second semester, they sent me to New York for, for the second semester. And I remember asking the, the professor, I said, well, he's, the professor said, do you want to know why we picked you for this assignment? And I said, sure. He said, <laughs> You didn't bother to tell us that your dad was vice president of public relations at General Motors Corporation from that impressed me. So that was uh, when I started uh, wanting to go further and farther in racing. I, I was sending out proposals, and uh, one of them landed on Hanley Dawson Jr.'s desk at Chevrolet dealership in Detroit, Seven Mile in the Lodge. Anyway, uh, I went and made my proposal to him, and then I, you know, I was folding up my, my papers and figuring he would say, well, thank you, no. And I said, no, I think I'd like to do this. And he bought the 1967 L88 Roadster, first one built that year of 20. He bought a trailer, and he bought uh, a vehicle, or got a vehicle off his lot for us to tow it with, and he gave us expense money, and we were off and running. And that year, I, I, won, I think I won the Central Division A production, and we went to the runoff the champion races they were at Daytona that year, and uh, I finished second, but he was happy with that. And, uh, but anyway, uh, so then uh, we decided we wanted to get a new car, I was going to order a new 68 L88 for the team, because I had gotten to know Jerry Thompson uh, through my Corvair racing, because he was, he was racing the Yanko Stinger at that point. So we decided we were, and he, Hanley Dawson told me, well, I tried to get the 68 L88, but they said that there weren't any more left. And I said, what? Anyway, so we said, okay, well, we'll just build one. <laughs> My brother Pete, he must have worn a groove in the, in the road from where, we, where our shop was up to the Chevrolet Otterburn warehouse. But we were getting parts from that place every day to put this car together. And uh, so we started out and we had a two car team. We started out both a production, the 68 and the 67, with Jerry driving the 67. And then we, we uh, said we were we were doing pretty well, but then Andy told me that he was going to have to stop sponsoring because of things that were going on. And so uh, I started sending out proposals to try to find sponsorship money. And in my high school days, I'd become a pen pal of Ed Cole. Anyway, so we were having dinner with my parents at their club, and, and uh, in walked Ed Cole and Dolly Cole. And they came over to the table and said hi. And Dolly said, how are you doing with your racing? And I said, well, you're doing pretty well, but Henry Dawson just told us that Henry's going to stop sponsoring us because of things that were going. I didn't ask him what was going on. But. So she said, do you have a proposal? And I said, yes. Can you get me a copy? Yes, ma'am. So anyway, he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to New York with Edward, 
because that's where they had the GM board meetings back then. So they want to give your proposal, show it to somebody that I know. Well, anyway, she marched into, and I forget the gentleman's name, I'm sorry, marched into his office. He was an executive vice president at Owens Cone Fiberglass. And Dolly was quite a spectacular woman, but she said, whatever his name is, <laughs> Johnny, I think you helped these boys. And I was at my desk at Rockwell the next Monday, and the phone rang, and it was Alan Carabin from Toledo, and he said, we have your proposal, and we'd like to have a meeting. So, and the rest is history. Everyone's scoring fiberglass began their sponsorship with us, and they sponsored us from the middle of 58, I mean, the middle of 68 till uh, uh, January of 71. And, uh, and they were the suppliers of fiberglass for the Corvette, correct? Yes. So it was, there, there was a good time. Yeah, they had a good reason. They wanted to get their message out to, well, not only GM, but the rest of the rest of the yeah. Yeah. And then you went on to, uh, you know, to fame and uh, success internationally. What was it like, you know, as an independent to be racing internationally like that? Well, um, you know, we, we didn't think about it a lot, obviously, because we were kids. But anyway, we, we worked very hard. And it, thanks to Zora and uh, Gib Elstead, uh, you know, we never got any money from General Motors, but we had, a, we had a parts program with Corvette Engineering. And so we would try, you know, new, we put hours on a new gearbox or, or hours on the rear end and do other work like that, keep track of the hours and turn them in. So, I mean, that, that helped budgets and stuff, but uh, we, we had really good success by winning Central Division A Production Championship several times, and uh, we won the Daytona 24-hour the T-Class at 70 and 71. Uh, 70 was Jerry's. Uh, car and then 71 was, was my car. 71 we finished fourth overall and first at GT and uh, we won the GT class at Seabrook in 70 and uh, we just uh, had an amazing run and uh, we built another car after that sponsored by the Bud Company and for the first time in our history we had racing engineers that knew what they were doing that had developed the Ford GT, uh, Mitch Markey and Lee Dexter. And we had the 73 Bud car, B-U-D-D, -D, um, was probably at the time the most sophisticated equipment on the track. And uh, we couldn't unfortunately keep engines in it. But we, uh, we did a lot of damage with it, theoretical damage. But it, it ran, it was really fast. It was amazing. Thank you, Tony. Ed, uh, do me a favor, bring us up to date uh, and up to the current day with uh, a little su uh, summary of the evolution of the front engine Corvette, and then, you know, why did the, why did it take so long to get the, uh, the new C8? It's, uh, yeah, that's a lot to cover. <laughs> but I'll be quick, because this is an audience that really, really knows Corvette, and I think I can talk maybe some uh, from behind the scenes. You know, it, it's kind of interesting, the stories of mid-engine Corvettes and rumors of a mid-engine Corvette go back to the 1960s. You know, you see the cover of Motor Trend magazine, you know, is this the new Corvette? 1972, my very first day at General Motors, and I'm sitting in personnel signing all the papers, and I see this flash go by on the, the tech center streets right outside the window of of personnel, and it was a silver mid-engine Corvette. It's 1972. And then a second one went by, totally different body shape, and I later, later found out one was the, um, a four, the Reynolds 427 mid-engine Corvette, and the other was the two-rotor. Both of them were silver. They were done by competing teams within design and engineering. 1972, and then over the years, it, there had been one concept vehicle after another. There were engineering mules and, and competitive vehicles, you know, that, that were purchased. 
to compare to what might be a new mid-engine Corvette. What a lot of people don't understand is how challenging it was for Corvette from a financial perspective. That's one reason why there wasn't a mid-engine sooner. Corvette struggled financially, and there are a couple times in its history where it almost went away, and I credit Jim Perkins with really saving Corvette and cementing its future going forward. And that would have been around C5, I believe. Mm. But with the mid-engine car, the, there are a couple other factors why it took so long. Um, awful lot of Corvette fans love the front-engine Corvette and didn't want to have anything to do with mid-engine. What I, I think is so great about Corvette is the circle of knowledge between Corvette engineering, Corvette design, Corvette customer, Corvette racing. The circle of knowledge and information is what makes it, I think, one of the most amazing vehicles on the planet. And you really see it in the, the new C8 vehicle. I mean, it's an amazing car, but they really listen to their customer. And for many years, the customers really weren't interested in a mid-engine car. Um, and it really wasn't until around the year 2000 that mid-engine cars became really comfortable to live with day in and day out. Had uh, air conditioning and cooling, you know, that, that really worked properly. Uh, a lot of them had overheating, many mid-engine cars, and just weren't a comfortable daily driver. And Corvette is a sports car that is obtainable financially, and is, you can drive it every day. And it wasn't until they could really get that equation really nailed that they felt comfortable in doing a mid-engine, or we felt comfortable in doing I give off lot question, uh, credit to Taj. Taj is an incredible leader, a real leader of Corvette engineering and Corvette um, development and the work that he has done to make the mid-engine Corvette what it is today. I'm glad we waited until we had somebody like Patch to, to do that. And he and I worked together very closely on, on the development of the car. In fact, my very last day at GM, it was the last design review I had was of the mid-engine car and it was pretty much complete at that time. There's still some work to do on details, but uh, I'll never forget that design review with them. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Ed, but when we had the senior leadership meeting, when you showed off the very first theme at the Heritage Center, so the top leadership of GM around uh, 250 people or so, and we're at the Heritage Center, and um, towards the end of the evening, Ed calls everybody over, and there's a, of course, there's always a little surprise at these meetings. There's a vehicle with a sheet over it, and then around it are all the engine cars that GM still owns, which is most. And so Ed pulls off the cover and unveils it, and I tell you, as a Corvette person, it was probably one of the most emotional moments in my career to see that car with all that, all that history around it. It was a phenomenal thing. And I think a lot of people don't know the, the difficulties of the engineering side of an engine car. There were a lot of last minute issues, a lot of technical hurdles to cross, and certainly a lot of hard work from Ed's team. And I think you, know, you deserve as much credit as Taj does for keeping that dream alive and doing such a beautiful car. Well, it was, thank you, thank you, Lowell. It was a lot of fun, and uh, there are those design challenges in doing a mid-engine car because it's got a proportion so similar to other mid-engine cars, but you know, staying close to the roots of Corvette and, and the DNA of the theme that goes back to Stingray was important in developing this new car. Well, since you mentioned Taj, let's, uh, let's watch the video of uh, Doug Fian because I think Doug mentions uh, Taj uh, uh, briefly in, uh, in the video that we recorded earlier with him.
with 100th victory. Something that we had, something that we had sought for over a year. We had a dry spell back there, and uh, so it's kind of. Thank you, Doug, for joining us. And I'm um, sorry you can't be here in person today, but I understand you've got some commitments up in Lime Rock Park. Tell us what's happening up there this week. Well, you know, Lime Rock is uh, one of America's most historic racetracks. It's it's the shortest racetrack on which we run. Laps are only 50 seconds. I mean, it is pandemonium racing. And we'll be there with the GT only class, which is going to make it really, really good because it'll be all GT cars. Um, and it holds a, holds a special spot in my heart and our team's heart because uh, Lime Rock was the venue in which we achieved our 100th victory. Something that we had something that we had sought for over a year. We had a dry spell back there, and uh, so it's kind of cool to head back to that spot knowing full well what we accomplished there. Yeah, when was that 100th victory? That would have been probably 2018, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now, Corvette Racing, uh, the, the modern version, was launched in uh, 1999 with a collaboration uh, with Pratt and Miller. Give us, give us a recap of, of, you know, how this came about and what uh, what Corvette Racing has achieved over the two plus decades. Yeah, well, you know, it goes back a little further. That was in the fall of 1996. Um, when Herb Fischel came to me and said, you know, we've got a new C5 Corvette coming out, it's going to be a pretty special car, it's kind of revolutionary in, in its design and its materials and its formulation, and part of the day Phil was heading up as chief engineer, he said, I think this is a pretty good shot at really doing the first factory back Corvette race program. Can you put something together that would make some sense and let's see if we can sell this to upper management. That was in the fall of 96. We uh, debuted in 1999 uh, at Daytona. Uh, we had a pretty successful out in there. We, we led right up until about the 20th hour of that race. We ended up on the podium, finishing third. Um, and the rest is kind of history. And when we look at that, I mean, I got to go back and look, but it's, I think since then, the 14 team championships, 13 drivers championships, 13 manufacturers championships, 118, 119 race wins, 83, 84 pole positions, maybe 90 fastest race laps, and not to uh, not to forget the fact that we've won the historic Le Mans event eight times, which is uh, pro probably our most most proud statistic of all. Um, it's been an amazing run. Yeah, and you and you had you did this with some serious competition. Uh, tell, uh, tell us about some of the the biggest competitors you had. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, you go back uh, in the early days, obviously it was Pro Drive with Ferrari, and then uh, they moved to Aston Martin. Um, in, in the in most recent times, it's been Aston, it's been Ferrari, it's been Porsche, uh, it's been Ford. Um, it's it's it, a, a, a whole group of manufacturers have come and unfortunately have gone, but uh, the thing I think that's uh, really assisted us in, in, in being consistent winners is the fact that we've dedicated ourselves to continuing year after year after year after year. Um, we've, we've never left IMSA, we've never left the WEC, we've never left Le Mans. And uh, that level of commitment is what has uh, played a key role in, in achieving all the success that we've had. And that's a testament to obviously uh, the dedication of General Motors and, uh, and, and people at Chevrolet and obviously the Corvette group who understands the value of, of racing uh, and what it brings to the brand and the company. Well, and, and you have a new role now uh, as uh, Corvette Racing Brand Ambassador, I understand. And uh, so, you know, tell us, I know, you know, you've talked about this in the past, the, the benefit that uh, Corvette Racing and Corvette and General Motors gets from a sizable investment in motorsports. Can you give us a little bit of your, your feeling on that? Well, interestingly enough, Eric, you know, when, when I sold this program, I had to explain to executives, in my world, in my mind, racing was way more than a checkered flag and a trophy. I mean, obviously, the win on Sunday, sell on Monday thing, um, I mean, that plays a key role in everything that we do. But, but I wanted this program to reach inside the company. I wanted to reach the individuals that were building, designing, working on the cars from the assembly line up. I wanted to develop a level of pride in them, their association with the brand, 
and I wanted to do that by race, and uh, and we've achieved that. So I mean, we have a we have a, 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 a deal with Corvette. If you, if you notice, you don't see Corvette advertised in any print ads. You don't see Corvette ads on TV. Corvette is advertised by its racing achievements, and uh, I also wanted to get close to the customer. And uh, you know, at each event, we have a Corvette corral where people come bring their Corvettes. We do presentations with the drivers, myself and others, and our sponsors, Mobile and Michelin. Um, we make those people feel like they're part of our team, not just not just a fan, but part of our team. I think we've been very successful with that, at that. And, and you know, when, when, when large companies say they know their customer, they know them demographically. At Corvette Racing, we know them personally, all right? We know their names, we know their kids, we know their pets, we know where they live, we know the color of their car. Uh, when you can when you can create that kind of bond, that's invaluable. Yeah. And so when, when we look at all the on all the levels that Corvette has, has brought success to the company and to the brand, it goes well beyond just standing on that top step of the podium. Um, the, the guys who, who work in the Cadges group, uh, in, in the in the the engineering group uh, and, and the design group with Kirk Bain and Tom Peters, who was there for the development of the C8. Uh, we know those guys, they know us, they come to the events. Establishing that level of pride in them is what has made this product so great and has made it so successful in the show. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you bring up the C8, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about how it's doing, uh, you know, radical departure from previous Corvettes and one that's been long anticipated. Yes, indeed, and and we knew it was going to be a challenge anytime you start with a brand new car. I mean, it, it can be a pretty steep learning curve. The benefit we had, though, was was working hand in glove with Cadge Group from a clean sheet of paper going back six, seven years ago. All right, um, it wasn't like we were just handed a finished production car. Cadge recognized the value of all the things that we learned in racing, and when you think about that and what we need in racing, it duplicates in, in today's world what you look at passenger cars. I mean, whether it's Lightweight materials, whether it's aerodynamic design, whether it's fuel economy, performance, all those are the same things now that designers are looking at to, to, to benefit the cars you and I purchase and drive on the road every day at all levels, whether it's an econo box or it's a pickup truck, an SUV, or a performance sports car. We all want those qualities, uh, uh, you know, woven into the fabric of that car. And uh, Tad recognized that, and so we started with them from a, from a race team perspective. In, in assisting and, and contributing to the design of that vehicle from a clean sheet of paper. So C8, when it got built, was as close to a race car as we've ever built a Corvette. Um, so although we normally would encounter a steep learning curve, this made things far more streamlined. Uh, and thus far in the you know, couple of years that we've been running, it's been pretty successful. Um, you know, we just finished coming off victories at uh, Detroit and uh, two victories at back-to-back at, -back at Watkins Glen. That's why I say I have to look at these numbers. Uh, we're, we're winning so fast, I can't hardly keep up. Um, and we're looking again to do that at, at Lyman. So the C8 is really the culmination of 25 years of, of working together, Pratt & Miller, the race team, and the uh, Corvette engineer. And that relationship has just grown deeper and stronger and bigger, more powerful. And uh, I think the C8 really uh, pretty much uh, symbolizes that. Well, best of luck to you and the team this weekend up at, uh, at, at Lime Rock. And, you know, say shout out to uh, the whole crowd here of Corvette enthusiasts that you have in the audience. Well, you know, those those that are there, I'm, I'm assuming, have probably come to a Corvette event, a Corvette event, or have, have heard me speak before. They all know how important they are to our program. They are the heart and soul. They are what drives this. At the end of the day, we're in one business, and that's to sell cars. They're the guys that buy them, and uh, we couldn't do it without them. I couldn't be more proud of how they have stood by us in the best of times and the worst of times. They are always there. They are relentless in their support of what we do. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, and they know that, because they know I like hammering it up and getting front. Uh, but you guys have a great time. Say hi to everybody there. I uh, haven't seen Ed Welburn in a while. Uh, Tony, I see every once in a while. Uh, Fred, if, if, if he's going to come this weekend, I want to reach out to him, because um, I've done a lot of stuff at the Simeo. Um, I'm, I'm just really sorry I can't be two places at one time. You guys have a great weekend.
Hey, thank you again, Doug, for joining us and uh, safe travels. Thank you, and we'll look forward to the next time we get together. Yeah.